So I want to talk about constraints in general, um, strategies in general from uh, many different um, fields or industries or whatever, and then talk about some very concrete strategies in the some, some points in the design space, uh, not to be exhaustive at all, um, but just to seed a few ideas that look very different uh, so that everybody working on content routing can kind of get, see different handles on the problem. Uh, checking, recording. Looks good. Uh, great. So uh, let's start at the beginning. Um, so at the end of the day, there's some very difficult constraints uh, that we're dealing with, and everything else uh, comes out of that. First one is causality. You can't violate causality. That's like, at least we haven't figured out how. Um, that means that we're bounded by the speed of light in sending messages. But that's about the hardest constraint. Uh, almost everything we do has to deal with this particular constraint. Um, the other constraints that physics gives us, like, information density limits and computational speed. Like we're so far away from the physical constraints there that those aren't problems. Um, the other physics oriented constraints are more around manufacturing. Like we're starting to get into the boundary of, um, like transistors are getting so small that it's now difficult to make them smaller. So we're starting to paralyze more. Um, and so that means that computers are not um, getting faster by doing more, op more single sequential operations per second, but we're, they're getting faster by replicating. Um, but so far, no problem. Like, um, computers, Moore's law continues uh, fairly unabated, um, and the other acceleration laws uh, are, are, are still so far away from fundamental limits that, that, um, that we're good there. Again, the main one, the, the, the problematic one, is the speed of light. So um, in general, that's good news. Uh, we can rely on ha hardware continuing to get better and better and better. And so the routing problems today look very different than the routing problems 10 years ago, and that looks very different than 10 years before that, and so on. A lot of networking um, theory, um, or yeah, like, like the syst networking systems theory that, that you read in textbooks and so on, um, still has this understanding of reality that based on what the hardware kind of looked like in the late 90s, uh, and so you end up, or like early to late 90s, so you end up with all kinds of statements about, no, you can't do routers that have the full routing table, and everyone's like, and, and you're like, why? And it's like, well, the routers at the time couldn't handle the full routing tables. Turns out that today you can totally handle full routing tables in, in hardware because just hardware has gotten that much better. We're talking about hardware getting better by many orders of magnitude in, in a time span that like we, we just connected everyone in the world and like humanity is not growing by many orders of magnitude every few years. So, um, so hardware has gotten dramatically better. Um, the, Accelerating return loss continue. Um, and there's this kind of bandwidth separating from storage thing. Uh, sorry, storage. Um, where the storage density is, um, or like the cost of storage per unit, per area, per volume, is decreasing so fast relative to bandwidth that you're getting the split between the two where um, our drives are getting denser and denser and denser and the bandwidth between computers is not improving nearly as fast, uh, which means that um, moving around information, especially larger and larger photos and video and so on, gets harder and harder all the time. Um, this is why content routing, this is why content addressing makes a lot of sense. Um, this comes from a physics-oriented view that um, as the hardware gets better, just moving around lots of information from one location to another is going to continue getting harder. And at the same time, it's just going to get a lot cheaper to have all of the content with you. Right? So these, thing, these things are about like uh, terabytes now. So you can have a terabyte in here. Um, and so like, how long until you have a petabyte in here? Right? Like, not that long. Um, maybe a petabyte's a little long, but like, you know, 10 terabytes is, is a lot. 100 terabytes is a lot. So if, you, if you're walking around with a terabyte here and a petabyte here, uh, you can start storing all of your personal information, all of the data that you care about in like your day-to-day -day files, all of Wikipedia, <laughs> like you can start walking around with full copies of the stuff. Um, at that point, content routing really matters because uh, you, you don't want to address files in Wikipedia by like go to the Wikipedia server somewhere else uh, only to realize that it's already in your computer. So uh, content routing will become an increasingly important part of the internet. Um, uh, great. So one other note on hardware. Um, getting a lot of hardware sounds uh, 
really difficult, and it is from a perspective of you having to individually set up a lot of hardware and a lot of facilities. But um, when you turn it into a whole network or an economy problem, it can get much easier. Uh, so think of um, the Falcon Network as an example of in about two years amassing an enormous amount of uh, storage capacity, right? So, uh, and, and these are like massive racks. Um, so if, we, if we're worried about uh, hardware here, or if we're worried about like the indexes getting so big in a single machine, um, then there's like a straightforward way to handle this, which is kind of like turn this into an open utility, turn this into an open service uh, that's blockchain powered, because then you can um, scale indexing um, in a straightforward way, right? Like you can turn this into um, a business that operators can go and, and run. Um, and this works in a pretty nice decentralized setting where you can have good protocols that define who gets to be, uh, what, what an, index, uh, an operator needs to do to become an indexer, um, the guarantees that the operator has to, has to provide, um, the SLAs of the service. Um, you, can, you can encode properties like censorship resistance into the protocol um, and so on and end up with like a really good, good setup. Uh, so I think that in general, it, it, it is the, the physics and the hardware, um, both well, the physical constraints and, and how the hardware is improving and the, and the rate of separation between bandwidth and storage um, is going to yield an environment where it's going to be fairly easy to have large dedicated racks everywhere with a bunch of the content or the content routing information right there. Um, and you don't have to go to a bunch of places. The problem is how do you find, <laughs> how, do you, how does your device and your computer know to get there, right? Um, uh, so let's talk about the internet. Um, the internet primarily today handles um, the internetworking part, which is how do you get a lot of computers and a lot of devices around the world to be able to join this shared medium and this shared environment in, in a like, cogent way and in a practical way. So it has to work, but it also has to work relative to a bunch of policies and constraints set up by many different groups. And that's why you end up with tons of different protocols. Like the internet protocol stack is enormous. And they, there's tons of inter, uh, interfacing systems that yield this um, you know, high performance environment where you can get tons of traffic through um, and you can satisfy a bunch of policy constraints, uh, but you have an extensible ex uh, expanding uh, system structure. Now, most of the internet is dealing with location routing, with peer routing. Most of the internet is about how you get IP addresses to be able to talk to each other and send packets to each other quickly and with, with the policy requirements. Um, policy requirements might mean like whether or not certain groups can talk to each other or um, uh, dealing with like different, um, how do you deal with congestion control? How do you deal with um, routing through certain routes as opposed to others? And how do you deal with the economics of those routes and, um, and so on? Uh, one other constraint here is or one other useful um, thing to think about is the grapevine of the internet exists because of both the kind of physical and hardware constraints and, and the regional constraints, but also because of the economic constraints. So um, the, the internet over time, the grapevine itself evolves to match the application, applications that are driving traffic through, through the internet. Um, and then once the, the grapevine looks a certain way, applications tune for that grapevine. So over time it like sort of set, settles However, you can shift it. Um, it's difficult, but, but you can do it. Um, now, it's certainly a lot easier to just look at the grapevine and how it works today, and then just place specific devices and specific software in those spots and avoid having to go all over the place. Right? So in most of the peer-to-peer -peer world, in most of the blockchain world, we don't really think about the internet grapevine. We think about like, oh, overlay networks where you can talk to anybody, and it just sort of works. And in reality, what that means is just tons of packets moving around in this grapevine. And that's not always what you want. In reality, what you want is to know precisely what computer is going to talk to what computer. You want to optimize latency. You want to find like, the right um, places to go, and so on. Uh, cool. So talking about platforms for a moment, um, there's a ton of different kinds of devices, especially once you go into IoT and manufacturing and so on. But like, sort of for the most part, most um, applications we have to worry about in the, in the shorter time frame look like um, you know, you have these large dedicated data center, ser data center servers that have super fast interconnect between them. So you can send packets within a, within a single data center in, you know, milliseconds, uh, like one millisecond or so, one to four. Um, and then um, sometimes faster, depending on what data center and if the data center is tuned to allow for that. So you can have one machine in one rack talk to another machine um, 
uh, sub, sub millisecond, I think. Um, and then you're dealing with things like home servers, which are, you know, some sets of people will have um, dedicated machines in their houses that are like, you know, 100 terabyte to petabyte scale things, um, but they're behind regular consumer ISPs, which suck, right? Like the, the pipe from home to the ISP tends to be extremely limited. Um, then you have laptops and desktops, which are uh, uh, pretty good now. Laptops are moving around a lot, so they have high churn. You don't really want to use them to store a lot of routing information. Desktops are more OK, um, but still are like, maybe the CPUs are really good. Uh, and sometimes they have access to GPUs, which is great. Um, and the drives might be, might be decent. But it's not petabytes. It's usually kind of you know single terabyte to ten terabyte scale. Uh, then you have mobile. Mobile is super churny. Um, very small devices. Battery constraints are really matter. You really don't want to use mobile at all to serve any traffic. It's mostly clients. Wearables even worse. Like <laughs> at that point, you're you're in a region of the internet that's like going over um, Bluetooth or near field communication and other kind of like um, other stuff that is just very very difficult to to um, at all deal with. However, wearables will need to be able to do content routing queries. These things will eventually get end up with resources that are, um, that, and they need to be able to speak the, some protocol to be able to get content. And ideally, you should go from the wearable into the phone, and that's it, or from the phone into your, into your laptop, and, then, and, and that's it. Um, but for the most part, right now, most of these things today are connected to the cloud. So all of these things are talking to the cloud, um, which, you know. Then you have other constraints uh, between operating systems and browsers where um, some OSs will let you at register services. So that means you can uh, deploy content routing as a, as a single service that can mount into the OS and then operate there. So imagine writing applications and so on that just can deal with a content routing daemon in your, in your OS. Um, this is how uh, DNS works in a sense. Most systems, like browsers have moved away from it, but um, you know, OS is shipped with a DNS resolver. Um, browsers, same thing. You can nowadays mount extensions. You can now um, sometimes ship uh, things into browsers. And certainly, if something becomes widely used, browsers will, will tend to adopt it. Um, and you have a decent enough pathway to try something out in some applications, show that it's working, and then eventually make it into browsers. Um, like today, we have IPFS and Brave. And that, you know, it's like millions of people that, that um, can just use that directly. Um, great. It's talking about protocols, um, there's a bunch of constraints coming from here. Um, but for the most part, just think of, a, of the TCP IP stack as extremely sophisticated, decades of work, making tons of different protocols, mostly for doing location routing, like location addressing and location routing. There's a family of protocols around name data networking and content-centric networking, which are entirely about content routing, except that most of that literature never quite um, got Merkle trees and hash linking. So most of that literature isn't, d does not have a good answers for security, does not have good answers for privacy. And so there's a lot of really good ideas in terms of routing protocols, um, but often, in, often they're not um, well, they're, they're, they're either not private or they're not able to leverage uh, content addressing in the same way. Their content addressing is different. It's not, it's not hash linking or uh, it's just, uh, it's mutable. But, but anyway, it does mean that there's a pile of literature that we, that we can um, uh, learn a lot from. Uh, yeah, I think from, so, so a couple of quick thoughts around properties. So the, to, I think content routing in order to be successful in the long term has to become um, something at the scale of, you know, um, go towards a scale of something like location oriented routing. It has to become separate systems, separate protocols that solve the problem. And so for the most part, most whenever we're dealing with content routing, um, don't, don't, think of like, don't think of it as like a problem if you end up creating other services or systems uh, in order to so solve the problem. Um, uh, it's okay to go in that direction, and optimization will require going in that direction. Actually getting to very high performance, large scale systems will end up there. Um, and yeah, there's a bunch of things that sort of protocols need to do to become sort of foundational, and they tend to sort of decouple from everything else. Um, yeah, uh, this is already in the, in the hierarchical, hierarchical consensus slide, uh, but this is sort of the, this was mostly oriented towards consensus, um, but it kind of roughly mirrors the, the, set, of, set, of, the set of properties required for content routing. Um, content routing might have a higher scale of transactions per second. 
uh, than this, but it's roughly around the same. Um, this is the map from Falcoin, so it, in very concretely for us, um, we want to have a, a, a system structure that like tunes for the throughput coming from storage providers, coming from these on-ramps, coming from retrieval networks, um, and uh, factor in regions. So um, we're headed in a direction where uh, a lot of our systems will end up with regional components. Um, now, it's not necessarily that it's two layers. Most regional systems have you know, the planet and then each region in, in one other layer. This could have, this could be kind of fractal where you can have um, many more regions opening up underneath. Think, think of DNS with many different le level, like trees with um, arbitrary hierarchy. Um, the, uh, this is kind of what the NDN, CCN uh, structure uh, looks like. And I think a lot of this is basically right. It's just that they, um, the thing in the middle, the, the thin waste is really hash linking. Hash linking is really the thin waste that enables all this to really work. Um, but there's a ton of protocols that you know, uh, are designed in the style of the location-oriented protocols, uh, are very efficient, very high performance, and so on. Um, and um, many implementations are, are, um, exist for a lot of these systems. Um, and, and so, but, but I think for the most part, uh, we can leverage a lot of knowledge from these systems. Um, there's a ton of different constraints that will come from applications, mostly in terms of the scale and the, the throughput, um, and, and also in terms of the secur security context, like what kind of privacy requirements. Um, do they need reader writer privacy? Uh, do they only need one of those? Um, do they need authentication in terms of being able to find out who, who needs what, um, and so on? For, for the most part today, most of the Web3 stuff does not do any reader writer privacy um, and does not do any authentication because it's, it's either public or what's public and accessible is ciphertext that you then use separately in another layer to do authentication. So you, in many cases, you don't have to deal with authentication in the content routing layer. Um, you just can distribute all the ciphertext and, and you do authentication in a separate, separate step. Um, this is, uh, yeah, the, the level of scale. Now, uh, let's look at a few strategies from, from different classes, from different systems. Um, the cloud tend, uh, settled around um, a, a kind of network makeup of having these data centers uh, per region, um, have a lot, ton of machines within uh, single data centers, uh, and they use those data centers to serve the content and the applications for a particular region of the world. Um, they have a set of edge points of presence in ISPs, to, and they follow sort of the grapevine, the internet grapevine, to get close to the users, and those um, points of presence tend to be for read-only caches, so that means um, CDN content and so on. Nowadays, we're starting to see applications being put all the way to the edge, so things like Cloudflare workers and so on are examples of, of shift putting the actual um, application processing all the way there. Um, but the problem is, like, once you do that, you have to think of consistency um, going from like edge to edge. Now, it turns out a lot of our distributed systems um, solutions to deal with this in, from data center to data center work just fine, edge to edge. Um, so, so these systems can work. Um, but again, most of the cloud is still kind of in these big, um, large-scale data centers with a lot of throughput in between those machines. So also think of that in terms of content routing. Um, the most humans will interface with content routing through clients in laptops, phones, and so on. However, most programs will internet interface with content routing within data centers. Most programs will operate over data in these massive scale data centers, and so content routing also has to tune for those. Um, these might be different protocols, right? So you might have a protocol that deals with how browsers want to do content resolution, or you might have protocols that deal with how, they, how you want to do data resolution within a data center. So once you're operating in a data center, if you ever have to leave the data center to go somewhere else, you, you, you kind of did something wrong. And so you, you, you want to prefetch most or all of the information that you're going to need into that environment before you run some large computation job. Um, because at that point, like, once you kind of have the machine running, you don't want to end up waiting for speed of light distances. Uh, you're dealing in microseconds or nanoseconds at that point. And so if you have to wait milliseconds for something, or hundreds of milliseconds, like that's a lifetime in, for, the, for the lifetime of a program. Um, there's other kinds of strategies that the cloud has settled on. Things like, again, tons of caching everywhere. Um, and then sort of like writing becomes expensive uh, and then you invalidate caches, but you can use hash linking to avoid that, right? Because you get this really nice 
cash inval automatic cash invalidation by the CID changing. So if something changes, you have a different CID, and you don't have to worry about invalidating caches at all. So you avoid one of the biggest problems uh, to worry about. Um, but it does mean that then you have to rewarm everything. Um, the cloud has also settled into these buckets and collections where um, people are able to group large amounts of content into a single related collection and then move that stuff around or give access to that stuff uh, in, in one place. And so that lets you aggregate lots of content together into one identifier that you then can provide content routing to that, right? So think of um, some large data set and, or like, like a Git repo or um, even some, something massive like terabytes in size or, or petabytes and that having one identifier that then gets routing information just for that one identifier. So today our content routing system in IPFS doesn't allow that. It, it, it only has um, uh, content routing for all the tiny little leaves um, and you might wanna be able to selectively choose what you wanna make content routable. Um, already mentioned kind of uh, consistency in regions. Uh, one other really big thing here is software-defined networking. Part of how the cloud got to where it is is by being making the entire environment very programmable. Uh, and today, our systems are fairly difficult to build. Uh, and so we can make some version of secure, um, decentralized software-defined networking. If we had a version of that, that would make our evolution rate on all of our stack dramatically better. Um, there's some, um, you, you can also look at the literature from the peer-to-peer -peer world. Uh, there's tons of really good ideas there. Those ideas tend, tend to be oriented towards these really large networks um, with you know, millions or billions of nodes. Um, and they tend to be these overlay networks that lose information about the underlying system. So they don't tune for the internet grapevine at all, or for the most part they don't. Um, and they tend to have lots of protocols for building structure out of unstructured environments and so on. They tend to be resource sharing oriented. This is all before um, economic mechanism design. Um, and they tend to be always sort of become some distributed search or lookup problem and trying to go from log n search into O of one search. Um, and you, there's tons of different strategies to do that, often by like pre-doing a bunch of the searches or building indices or making like compressed indices and distributing those around and, and so on. Um, when you get into consensus, uh, it's a totally different landscape where you have consistency over the stuff that you really care about um, and you get a structure to maintain a set of computers online together. You get state machine replication of some log that you care about. You get automatic orchestration because all these things have, in order to maintain consensus, they have to know about each other. So you already have all the bits that you need for doing orchestration of these machines. You have automatic liveness checks by <laughs> seeing that who's voting on what. So consensus is a really good way of building kind of like these large scale cluster um, orchestration systems. Uh, and then you get into blockchains that you know, blend peer-to-peer -peer and consensus and other, and, and also in, in introduce smart contracts, which, which give you economies, mechanism design, and so on. At that point is when you can start reasoning about creating um, protocols that let, um, where you can start verifying certain thing, operations or um, defining roles for certain programs in the network and describing ways in which those will work together to achieve certain um, uh, certain results, and you can think about collaterals and staking and slashing and so on, and all of that sort of comes alive thanks to thanks to the ability to construct arbitrary mechanisms. Um, one of, one other thing here, uh, sorry, I had a, an extra. Uh, one other component here is that you you blockchains have constructed a lot of specialized hardware to run blockchains. So um, by requiring certain kinds of cryptographic operations. Blockchains have, um, and, and by creating an economic um, model that allows anybody to contribute hardware and get rewarded proportionally for that contribution, um, they've created an environment where blockchains can summon hardware to solve problems really quickly. Like we're <clears throat> things like Falcon got built really fast, you know, two, two, almost 20 exabytes of, of capacity. Um, Bitcoin in like 10 years became one of the largest energy consumers on the planet. Um, massive amounts of hardware dedicated to Bitcoin, including many generations of specialized hardware building. Right? We're talking about ASICs, like many generations of ASICs built just to do Bitcoin mining. Um, now we're, we're starting to get um, zero knowledge ASICs, uh, like actual chipsets designed to do um, cryptographic operations 
just to be able to do zero knowledge proofs and so on. So this means that like if there's a bunch of operation, if we can design a content routing system, but we have some operation that's really expensive, but it's really valuable to do that cryptographically because we get some important property or we are able to decentralize the thing that way, um, that's okay because blockchains can just cause all that hardware to be built. Um, and in you know, two or three years, you now have a super fast system. Um, the other part here is um, to maintain massive indices around the world with extremely high SLAs, we're talking about open services and open utilities. Like we're, we're really, this is what blockchains were designed for. So you can think of using blockchains to build content routing protocols. Um, it's not clear whether it's like one blockchain or, or there'll be many. Um, but when you think of the scale of what location addressing and location routing requires to be high performance, um, content routing will likely require that kind of, that kind of operation too. Um, yeah, and so uh, looking back to the internet and location routing, the wor that world has hundreds of specialized protocols, uh, many different kinds of routers, like many generations of devices and operating, entire operating systems built just to do location routing better. Um, tons of hardware, entire physical buildings have been constructed to build internet exchanges where you can have location routing go, go better. Um, now content routing can reuse a lot of the stuff or it could cause similar kinds of structures to be built. Um, this goes all the way into reshaping industries, reshaping economies, and even like law, like this entire international law designed around the constraints of location addressing and location routing. Um, and, like, and if content routing works at scale, it'll cause the same kind of thing. Then people, like, laws will be written about how to deal with content routing. Um, uh, so yeah. And, and <clears throat> Again, the, the NDN and content-centric content networking literature has, is exactly sort of like the field that we should be learning from uh, with the caveat that um, now with hashes and now with capability crypto and now with zero knowledge proofs and so on. Uh, so I want to sort of finish by talking about a few concrete strategies. So one is um, I, don't, I don't, really don't think the small routers are going to cut it. Uh, I think small routers work in environments where you're in a local area network and you're trying to, um, you're just kind of operating here. So yes, in this room with all our computers, these like s relatively small routers, I mean, they're bigger than routers were maybe two decades ago or a de even a decade ago. Um, but these small routers have super high churn, really hard platform to deploy software to. And so they're, they're good to route between when applications are running here, but they should not be serving anything for people way far away in the grapevine. If, if we're sort of requiring that, uh, I think we've, we've kind of lost. I don't think counter rat routing is going to work that way. Um, I think instead, what's much more likely to happen is that we will define ways of, for large routers to appear, um, be incentivized to appear, and, and then to operate well in a decentralized network where you can lean into you know, terabyte-sized routers where that's, this means dedicated computers in buildings or in houses or, or in ISPs, um, or petabyte-sized routers in ISPs and, um, and data centers and so on. And this is totally achievable. It just sort of needs an incentive structure. It needs a, um, a, a model for how do you decentralize that operation and so on. And I think that this is where uh, content router will get here through, through these large routers. Uh, I also think regions are going to be critical to include in some way. Um, and so that, because it lets you solve one of the biggest problems, which is this speed of light latency problem. So you can bound the regions and say, great, content routing operates in this region. Um, and you can decide whether you replicate worldwide state. So you might have some state that is meant to be replicated everywhere. And so you can just bring all that state into that region, make it available there. Um, or you might have regional state. So it could be that applications um, evolve and want a model where they specifically make content routable in a particular region. Um, and it's okay if, you, if you're trying to find that content and you have to communicate across to that region and you pay the latency hit, that might be okay. Because you might have very large amounts of fast changing content uh, that only sort of uh, mostly matters to devices and programs in that region, um, and it's okay to do that. So the, the best example of this is um, content routing information required in a single data center. So if you're running a ton of operations in a single data center, and most of the programs are going to be there, you don't want to replicate all of that information everywhere else in the world. Um, if only the programs there are going to care, uh, then it's potentially way easier to ship your program into that environment, run it from there, leverage content routing information there, and then move on. Um, 
Now, however, however, for most of the information on the on the human accessible internet, like the internet that we want to uh, view and so on, we want most of that to be accessible everywhere. Um, and so that means some amount of that information has to be replicated everywhere. Um, the good news is that moving around, like once you've kind of uh, moved data somewhere, uh, it can just stay there for a long time. It's, it's fairly cheap to maintain data in one region. So all content address data can just replicate into different, different places. Um, I think that this model from hierarchical consensus is extremely useful uh, because even though it sounds like crazy to like use a blockchain to maintain an index that's supposed to be high performance, um, this scalability model that just lets you add arbitrary, you know, it lets you horizontally scale a blockchain by adding new, new networks um, maps onto this content routing model really well. You can do all of these regions as these um, specific subnets and you can have subnets that are meant to be, so think of like these, these three um, you know, multiple layers where you have one network for the planet, one network for a particular um, uh, continent or, or a country or something like that, and then you have a subnet for a particular data center. So you could decide whether your content routing information belongs in the whole planet, in a particular continent, or in a particular data center. And if you have that model, you can then start um, making those data center specific content routers like massive and move at really high, high speeds, um, but you don't have to kind of aggregate all that information and post it somewhere else. Um, and you can still resolve all those queries, you just have to pay the latency hit of going in there. Um, and another useful thing that, that comes from Utico is that it'll have, it's a full blockchain, it, it'll have the FEM uh, once that lands. I don't know if that's dead already, but, but it will be. And then um, it's native IPLD, so all of this stuff, all the content routing records that we're making and all the CADs and so on, um, Utico com comes out of the box with all of that tooling. Sound good? Great.